Well, good afternoon. It is such a great privilege to be at a university where we have on our faculty two former heads of government. And it's a great pleasure to engage them both today in a conversation about the state of the world. Ernesto Zedillo uh, is a graduate of the Yale Economics Department, went on to many distinguished positions in Mexican government and ultimately to be the president of Mexico from 1944 to 1994 to 2000. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, he's only a, only a child. <laughs> that was Spain, actually, where the guy was from. <laughs> Lasted that long. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so uh, President Zadio returned to Yale uh, after his tenure as president to lead the Yale Center for the Study of Globalization. Um, former Prime Minister Tony Blair uh, served, as we know, with distinction as the British Prime Minister for a decade, and he, uh, and he uh, followed his, funds, his son's footsteps to Yale uh, and came uh, to take on the, the position as the Howland Distinguished Fellow and to lead the program in faith and globalization, and as you know, has been teaching a course on that subject here both last year and this year, and he'll be back again next year to continue with, with, uh, with that endeavor. It's interesting, I'm gonna, we're gonna have try to run this like a conversation, and it's interesting uh, 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 to note that both of these great world leaders were attracted to spend some of their time in the academic world after their period of leadership because the subject they wanted to reflect upon was globalization in both cases. Uh, and both are concerned that the benefits of globalization be widely disseminated and that the threats to globalization, the, th uh, the threats that might dissipate or destroy those benefits should be confronted, thought about, analyzed, and, and taught. <clears throat> and in one respect, uh, Prime Minister Blair's main concern has been with the threats that d religious divisiveness, cultural divisiveness based on religious ideology might be front and center in undermining the benefits of globalization. Professor Zadio has focused on a number of issues, but in particular on the potential that economic nationalism and, and that national economic policies, the inability to agree on a global regulatory system and financial architecture might undermine the benefits of globalization. So I'd like to start the conversation by engaging them both on those central top, those topics that are central to their own thinking about uh, globalization and central to the reason that they're here. So Tony, let's start with you and talk, tell us a little bit about your, your thinking and how it's evolved as you've led this course here at Yale um, about how does religion pose a threat to globalization and what can be done about it? First of all, Rick, can I just to say what a thanks to, to Yale for giving me the opportunity to, um, to teach a class here. It's, it's been an absolute honor and privilege, and, and the students have been a, a joy to work with. So uh, thank you all very much indeed for giving me that chance. And it's also great to be uh, reconnected again with Ernesto, who is somebody I have a huge admiration for and did a fantastic job as president, and who I used to learn a lot from when I was starting in office. Um, Look, my view is very simple, that, that the 20th century was a century of uh, political ideology, capitalism versus socialism, communism, fascism. I think those arguments uh, have largely been now resolved into quite a narrow framework between left and right, which is not to say you won't still have Republicans and Democrats, but it won't. Um, the same ideological impulses of a political nature that dominated the 20th century, I don't think that's going to be the issue in the 21st century. 21st century, I think the big issue is open versus closed. In other words, with this force of globalization that's changing people's lives, changing economies, societies, are people open to its possibilities or do they close down in the face of it? Into that um, paradigm, if you like, open versus closed, comes the issue of religious faith. Religious faith as a phenomenon is not diminishing, which people thought it would. A lot of people used to think in the West, as people became better off and became more enlightened, religious faith would diminish. It isn't diminishing. Um, religion is actually growing in the world, not in all parts of the world, but overall it is growing. Religion can be a force for good, or it can be a force for ill. We see religion in many of the conflicts that dominate the world today. Um, and there it is a force for extremism and, and ill. In what I do out in the Middle East, I see this um, uh, many times, 
Um, but it can also be a force for enormous good. There are people that do extraordinary acts of selflessness in the cause of others through religion. So a large part of the health infrastructure in Africa is delivered by faith groups. So it can be a force for good, a force for ill. My question is this, and this is the, the question, because I think you need an academic basis to answering this question as well as simply a practical basis, is how do we design the policy and what is the right framework within which these issues to do with religion and politics can be resolved, and how do we make religious faith a source of progress for peaceful coexistence rather than a source of division and conflict? And I think that is one of the big issues of our time. It's an issue that, in a practical sense, I had to deal with as a political leader. And now I can come to the more contemplative and reflective atmosphere of, of Yale uh, and try and get educated. <laughs> so that's really what it's about for me. And, and where, where do you see this? Where are the signs of real hope and progress here? When, where, in what areas of the world do you think that there could be gains made in international rela relations or in intranational conflict by working with religious groups and bringing faith groups together? I mean, what, 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 what's the main area of focus for you? Well, I think the interesting thing is that there are people right around the world now who are trying from their different faith perspectives to engage with each other, learn about each other, and work out how they counter those forces of reaction and division within each faith um, that, that can pull people apart. So, you know, what my uh, office out in, in Jerusalem is right on the division between East and West Jerusalem. So you, in the morning, uh, early morning, you get <coughs> wakened by uh, the mosque. Um, you look out of the window and you see on the other side in West Jerusalem, um, you know, the Orthodox Jews going about their business. And there you are with this intense religiosity in, in the Holy Land in Jerusalem. And you realize that in this confined space, it's like a kind of microcosm of the, of the world, if you like, in this confined space, people of different faiths, different cultures, unless they can learn to respect each other, not just tolerate each other, but respect each other, and live with each other, we will never get peace. So I think the hopeful thing is that amidst all the conflict and division, there are people within each religious faith calling upon their own scripture and their own history to say, actually, what motivates us as religious people is some sense of compassion, social justice, common humanity, rather than some um, source of identification of me with my religion against you with yours. Mm -hmm. So uh, look, you know, I, I was British Prime Minister for 10 years. You've got to be an optimist. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, in the end, I am optimistic, because I think within the human spirit, um, religion uh, at its best answers something that is, in fact, the human spirit at its best. Mm -hmm. So drawing upon, it's, I'm st I really am struck by the similarities in what motivates the two of you, because you're really saying that the hope is to draw upon the positive elements in religious faith, the, the, the compassion for others, the empathy for others. And so in other words, being open to the views of others is a crucial element in using religion as a tool for good. And it's so interesting because I think, as I, Ernesto and I go back a long way, uh, he took my economics course in his first year in graduate school. Um, but he's not that old. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, for so long, you've been an advocate for economic openness rather than closedness, for, for, for nations opening up to the world to foreign investment and trade, and, and uh, as opposed to closing off. How serious a threat do we have now uh, in, in this respect to the benefits of globalization? Well, I think the, the threat is, is, is very serious, Rick. Uh, we have gone through a sort of a golden age of globalization, again, because we had other eras of great globalization, in the, for example, in the second half of the 19th century. And yet, that was over, that was finished with the outbreak of the First World War. At the time, it was geopolitical reasons, partly caused by <laughs> religious <laughs> rivalries, in a way, uh, and other factors. And that uh, eventually destroyed uh, globalization. And uh, well, we recovered after the Second World War, great human cost uh, in between. And since the end of the Second World War, progressively, we have had this increase in integration, which I think has brought uh, significant prosperity 
and in a way has also been a factor of international peace and stability. Well, some people thought that this time around, this uh, globalization was not uh, in any way or could not be destroyed. Uh, well, actually, over the last year, we have got the sense that it could happen again. The crisis that erupted with enormous force in the fall of 08 uh, really, at some point, uh, could have become a total collapse in the financial system, in the economic system, and could have caused uh, dramatic disintegration, uh, since we hadn't seen in many decades. Well, now we know that thanks to the aggressiveness of economic policy, uh, to some degree of international coordination, the worst has been avoided. But in no way we can say that the risks uh, of a major disruption of globalization has been left behind. And what is the big challenge? I think the big challenge is that in order not only to fully uh, overcome this crisis, but also to be able to retake uh, economic growth, but without going to business as usual, that is to say, to go back to the global imbalances that put us in the first place, we will need uh, an immense degree of international coordination and cooperation. There is no way the US can avoid to go back to huge uh, current account deficits and to borrow a lot of money if uh, those that provided those resources in the previous years to the US don't do something with their economic policy too. So you need agreement, you need coordination, you need synchronization. This is not to say that everybody has to do the same at the same time, but we need to have some basic understanding uh, not only about macroeconomics, but also about financial regulation. Well, what is the problem? The problem is that domestic politics, for good reason, because when you have 10% rate of unemployment, people feel bad, and people start thinking, well, why are we tolerating the Chinese to export so much, you know? Uh, why are we tolerating other countries to take jobs from this country? Why aren't, uh, aren't we, why should we worry about others? And so on and so forth. So the problem is that domestic politics can run against international cooperation. So this is going to be the big predicament of leaders in the years to come. How to explain to people that it is in our own interest to be coordinated, to cooperate, and try to find common solutions for common problems that cannot be addressed by individual countries alone. And in my view, if we are not uh, capable of generating the, this international cooperation, then I think that globalization could be in very serious trouble. So, so what's the vehicle for this kind of coordination? Is it the G20? Is it some redefined uh, uh, international financial institution of some kind? Well, I think uh, this, ha this has to start at the level of national leadership. You know, because uh, let's say President Obama, Prime Minister Brown, President Sarkozy, President Calderon, President Lula go to the G20. Well, it's not just to sit uh, down there. It's because they are willing and they under understand that we need this international cooperation. But uh, they go there not only to exercise leadership vis-a-vis -vis the people that are seated there, but the most difficult part of the job is to explain to their own people that it is in their self-interest, enlightened self-interest, to give something so that problems which are common to everybody can be addressed. And this is very tough, because if you look at President Obama, well, every day he has dramatic pressures. I mean, with this rate of, unempl of unemployment, it is very hard to, to avoid the kind of domestic politics that we are seeing here. And all of those forces run against what he probably wants to say and needs to say and need to do, needs to do vis-a-vis -vis that international forum. So you need enlightened national leadership, but you also need, you know, good international leadership where leaders go there, commit themselves, and then go back home to do the homework, which is a very tough homework. Mm. You think that's a good recipe, Tony? I yeah, mean, no, I, yeah. I, th I think the single most difficult thing at the moment as a political leader is, is what I would call the, um, 
the clash between the correct short-term politics and the correct long-term policy. Because mm -hmm. the short-term political pressures are all pushing people towards closing down protectionism, um, you know, you look after yourself. Actually, the only sensible long-term policy is to do what Ernesto was saying and to try and make sense of globalization and ensure that, that you get the, the right coordinated policy to make it work properly. But here is the thing that I think is really important about this, and this is what I came to um, understand, I think, really on, only over time. I think with globalization, the only way it works in the end is if it's imbued with some sense of justice. You know, the problem is, is very, you, what you're asking people to do is to open up to the world, right? And you're asking them to do so in, in circumstances in which the world is a very uneven and unjust place. You know, unequal, certainly. And the question is, how do you persuade people, since the only way the world is going to prosper is if it does remain open, how do you persuade them to accept that? Now, it's all very well for us in the tops of our societies in the West to say, well, globalization is a great thing. But actually, for many millions, potentially billions of people in the world, they look at globalization and, and they ask, well, what? What is it for me? Yeah, what, what, what's it going to do for me? So I think the thing is, this is to, to build on what Ernesto was saying, what is important is not just to get that coordinated policy, but to get it in such a way that we start to realize you have got to have a, a, a policy towards globalization that is then trying to inculcate globalization with some form of, of, of values and justice is right at the heart of it. When I, I did the G8 in 2005, and even then we started to invite Mexico and um, Brazil and China, India, and so on, because we could see that, that the world was changing. We put at the heart of that um, Africa and global poverty in Africa. And the reason for that, I mean, I remember the debates at the time, and people said, well, this is a great social cause. We understand it's very important. You've got all these poor people in Africa. It's very sad. Let's help them. And I was saying, there is a huge reason of self-interest why we should be taking this action. Um, because unless that, that almost one billion people in Africa start to see in the end that they have some advantage in globalization, they will end up resisting this process. And they will end up becoming a force of reaction uh, against us in the West. So I think you know, this, this question, open versus closed, how do you make it work, whether it's in religious faith or it's in economic policy, I think that is the central you know, political question of our time, and it's a very tough one for political leaders. And this criteria that uh, Tony has explained so well applies not only to those countries that have been left on the sidelines of globalization, as many in Africa, but I think it also applies to many citizens of the developed countries, of the countries that have got to be rich to a great extent thanks, thanks to globalization. Uh, but it so happens that inside the United States, and inside the UK, inside many other rich countries, there are people that are on the sidelines of globalization uh, that uh, are not only in the sidelines, that may be threatened in their situation, professional or whatever, uh, by globalization. So I think governments uh, do have the responsibility to help those people, not in the sense of giving them a blank check, you know, I'll pay you whatever damage globalization causes upon you, but rather how do you equalize opportunities for those people in terms of education, in terms of the training, in terms of, of, of some social safety nets. Otherwise, those, peoples, almost, all, those people, almost by definition, are going to be adversaries of, of globalization. Uh, but the problem is that if that becomes a too strong political force against globalization, somebody else and the majority of people in societies will be affected. Mm -hmm. So you better compensate them and support them so that they are not a force against globalization. One of the audience questions actually picks up on the point you just made about Africa. Uh, to, to, to want to ask you, given the tremendous emphasis you put on poverty eradication and health, improving public health in Africa, uh, one, are you dismayed by the recent sort of slippage in terms of uh, aid that's going to Africa, and what can be done, what can be done to 
actually turn that around, accelerate, uh, and where, where are the opportunities to improve the way that the wealth, well-being of Africa can be brought up by assistance from the developed world? And I think I actually do in another part of my uh, political afterlife, as it were. Um, I, I do um, projects in Africa um, which are about governance. And so what we do is we get teams of, we bring in teams of um, young people and we, we interact alongside the president. We do this in Rwanda and Sierra Leone. Uh, we're, we're about to do it in Liberia. And, and basically we try to build capacity in those countries. And he, here's, here's, again, something I learned from my time in office. I mean, I think it's important that we keep to our aid commitments. And I think it's a shame if we, um, if we start to diminish the commitments we've given, because that will be seen as a breach of faith by those African countries. But I also think this, that in the end, the most important ambition for any African country is to get to the point where they wave goodbye to the donor community. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the solution for Africa is, lies as much in the realms of governance and capacity, in acting against corruption, in making sure that you have democratic, sustainable political systems, in making sure that you have the right um, um, uh, business environment to attract private investment. Actually, some of the be worst trade barriers in Africa are between African countries themselves, not between Africa and the outside world. And so I think it is a combination of the help from the outside, but in the end, one of the most exciting things that's happening in Africa today is a new generation of African leaders who kind of want to do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, that is the best way to do it. And when I was in uh, Rwanda just a short time ago, and I was driving around uh, Kilgali and actually seeing in Kilgali the, the enormous amount of, uh, of, of private sector enterprise that was coming there. And we just opened a big initiative to, to get more um, you know, investment into the country. I thought, you know, it's when you see that younger generation of Africans deciding to take the reins of power into their own hands and their own destiny in their own hands that we'll really get somewhere there. So I think it's important that we keep up that, you know, that commitment right. from right. the outside. But one of the things I, I learned during my time in office is that actually what some of these countries need as much as aid is good governance. Mm -hmm. it, 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 wasn't, uh, it wasn't foreign aid that finally got the Indian economy going in 1991. It was domestic will, political leadership, and reform, Yeah, for and example. Yeah. Um, so both of you, had another interest that, that are shared by, by our two professors uh, is um, uh, an interest in climate change. Ernesto had a major conference here a couple of years ago uh, about the, de the debate on optimal policies for, uh, to remedy global warming. Prime Minister Blair has been active in working with a number of countries in their preparation for the Copenhagen conference. Here we are. Copenhagen is, shall we say, warming up. Um, and hopefully won't get overheated. <laughs> I think they should treat you with respect as the president. Uh, <laughs> there should be polite laughter at that joke. <laughs> it's Yale. We're tougher critics here. Right. <laughs> so prognosis, what's going to happen? And where, where are we going to go from? I mean, what kind of agreement are we likely to get in Copenhagen? Uh, and where will that lead us? You, you are very good at uh, <laughs> forecasting the future. <laughs> no, well, uh, Rick knows uh, my well, my, my position, which is derived from the analysis that uh, more knowledgeable people than me have produced uh, precisely at this university. Bill we Nordhaus. have great yeah. thinkers, yeah. Uh, fortunately, here. And uh, I have been uh, all along uh, pessimistic about uh, the likelihood of getting an agreement, an international agreement, that somehow tries to take uh, the f basic features of the Kyoto Agreement and try to make it for a longer term. Uh, in my view, uh, trying to negotiate a global cap and trade agreement is uh, a global impossibility. <laughs> uh, by trying to negotiate a meaningful, I mean a binding, effective uh, global cap and trade, uh, I think it's, it's not really possible. 
because once you are doing that, that is to say trying to define a, a global cap and, and, and divide it among countries, and you need everybody to be somehow on board, then that sort of becomes uh, a zero-sum game. And uh, it is a game or a, a problem that has, uh, that, that has no solution. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all along, the emphasis has been on getting commitments towards uh, quantitative targets with the idea that once you adapt all those uh, individual commitments, you will have uh, a global commitment that will match what the scientists are telling us uh, that should be reasonable to avoid uh, a higher probability uh, of a dangerous increase uh, in, uh, in average temperature in the world. Well, uh, unfortunately, the negotiation has not been like that. I don't think we are going to get uh, a good, effective uh, uh, agreement in, in Copenhagen in the sense that was envisioned by people that pursue that uh, avenue of negotiation a few years back and recently. But I think we are going to get uh, important elements uh, that in a way will constitute a first uh, important, meaningful step uh, with a longer term uh, view for the solution of this problem. So my guess is that uh, in a few years, uh, countries will have to come back uh, and try to build on what will be achieved in Copenhagen. I think uh, we will see progress, but we will not see the kind of progress that some people would like to lock uh, right now to say, now we have a solution, we can have peace of mind, that we are not in the trajectory of uh, doing what it takes to control global emissions. I don't think we should be uh, as optimistic as that, but I think we should be ready to be, uh, you know, to, to look with uh, uh, some satisfaction to the effort that I am sure will be put intensely next week and it will deliver not the perfect agreement, but something that it's a base to build upon. I, I agree with the conclusion. I, I'm actually surprised to find in this case um, you even more pessimistic than I about what, how, how much will get done this time. Uh, uh, Nick Stern, whose idea of what, how much needs to be accomplished in terms of the pace of carbon reduction, actually said just the other day that he thinks the sum of the national commitments that are being offered actually are very close, very close to being on track for what's needed to keep global temperatures from rising two degrees. That was, a, I thought, fairly optimistic assessment of what's going on. You know, we, it may turn out better than we think. It clearly won't get all resolved at this, at this meeting. And the, you know, the developing countries clearly are not willing to pick yet very aggressive targets, partly because of what you were saying earlier about a sense of justice, a sense that these are countries that have not yet had the opportunity to develop as much as the, as the West and that they ought, to, they ought to have a little room to, to grow before the caps have to pinch them. What, what's your sense of uh, yeah, looking at it's, it? It's a, this is a, a really tough political challenge, isn't it? Because the, 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 the central thing to bear in mind is that the difficulty with a global deal is that you're marrying together two worlds at completely different stages of development. Exactly. So um, China and India uh, are to undergo rapid industrialization over the next 10 or 15 years. They're not going to sacrifice that industrialization because that is their route out of poverty for their people. So they've got to transfer hundreds of millions of people from poor subsistence farming. I mean, in China, about 60% of the population is engaged in farming. Now, in your economy in the US is what, 4%, 3%? Less two. Than, yeah, two, yeah. same as us in Europe. Um, so the, just think about the change and think about the fact that in, um, in, in China, um, they, if we shut down all the emissions in the UK, so we were emitting absolutely no CO2 emissions at all. The rise in Chinese emissions would make up the difference in 18 months. <laughs> so just to get it in context, I mean, China is about to build over the next that's few that's really years amazing. more power stations, and most of which will be coal-fired, because that's the cheapest source of energy for them, mm -hmm. than the whole of Europe put together since the Second World War. So 
you know, and then India is going to come behind that. So this is this is the difficulty. And the question is how, as Ernesto absolutely rightly says, how do, how do you therefore, you know, rather than what I keep saying to people about Copenhagen is don't make the best the enemy of the good. The, 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 the problem of being a political leader, and I think both of us have tried to avoid this in our, our ways, is, is, you know, once you've been in office, you should never, after you leave office, forget how hard it was in office. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I was telling my class a couple of, um, a, a couple of uh, seminars ago, um, you know, the, when you're a political leader, like, you, you, you're the recipient of a lot of advice, okay? Uh, much of it. Some unsolicited. <laughs> right. Most of it unsolicited, <laughs> and most of it after you receive it, you wish you hadn't. Uh, <laughs> but I was telling them about the very, f I shouldn't really say it's a bit naughty, but there was a, the very first Labour leader, this guy called Keir Hardy, started off the Labour Party, was desperate to break into the parliamentary system. And this was before women's suffrage. And the Pankhursts, who led the great campaign um, in favour of women's suffrage, they were they were obviously campaigning for Keir Hardy to take up the, the cause of women. But one of the Pankhurst sisters had also done a study on what was wrong with British society and, and had ascribed the main part of the problems to the sexual misdemeanors of men. So she wrote to Keir Hardy and said, said that he should campaign on the slogan of votes for women and abstinence for men. <laughs> and, Keir Hardy wrote back this beautiful, elegant letter to her saying, thank you very much for your advice. The electoral propensities of which are not immediately discernible. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, so take what I'm about to say now about what they should do in Copenhagen uh, with, with mindful of the fact it's very easy from the outside to preach to those who've got to take these decisions. But my view is actually this, uh, and it echoes something Ernesto has just said. The truth is, our knowledge of the science and technology is going to change dramatically over the next years. Therefore, the most sensible thing now is to set the world on a different path, and even the accumulated commitments that are being made now, especially if you can improve them somewhat, but even those accumulated commitments add up to a significant switch in direction. So sometimes in Europe, people say to me, oh, President Obama's got to promise more than he's doing it, and I'm saying to him, look, he's about to make a commitment to 2020, which is massive in American terms. So, you know, it's all very well for us to stand on the outside and say, why don't you do more? But actually, even that is going to imply a major switch in your economy towards a low carbon path. Now, I think, therefore, what we should do is get the best we possibly can in Copenhagen and then accept that a few years down the line, you're going to have to review those commitments and see if you can expand them in the light of the science and technology that you will develop. And one further thing I think is really important. There's no, look, there's, there's no point in denying this. As a result of the financial crisis, climate change has not altered as an issue, but it has altered in the minds of the public as a priority, somewhat. You know, let's not say to everyone, but I mean, let's not be unrealistic about this. And my view is I have always said about the climate change question, there are reasons, sensible reasons, to do with the environment for making this change. Because even should the science prove halfway right, it is still definitely worth taking action as on the precautionary principle at least. But there are reasons today of energy security that are every bit as important. And the fact is, you know, your country, my country, we get our sources of energy, often from highly unstable parts of the world. It, it is in our own self-interest as a matter of energy policy, quite apart from the environment, that we try and move towards a low carbon future. And I think it's possible to take that step in Copenhagen. And if we get an agreement in Copenhagen, which I think it is possible to do, even if it is based really on the accumulated commitments already given, we should not be in under any doubt that is a hugely significant political achievement and will require itself a massive amount of political will to implement. Very good. Um, let's shift to another subject. Last year when we had a conversation like this right here in this very hall, um, it, uh, Barack Obama had just been elected president of the United States and I asked you Tony, what, what, what kind of advice you would give to an incoming president about America's 
role in the world? And you answered that your advice to President Obama was that he should listen and he should lead. Uh, and you expanded on exactly what you meant by that. Uh, at the end of you know, nearly a year in office, I, taking seriously your, your, uh, your warning that you don't, you don't like to uh, uh, make easy criticism of people sitting in office, that's still, I think everyone would be interested in your views of how do, you, how do you think President Obama has done in the foreign policy domain in his first year? Well, I think an example of listening would be the Cairo speech where he reached out to the Islamic um, world. Um, I think an example of leading is what he's just decided in respect of Afghanistan. Um, so, look, these, are, these challenges are, are really, really difficult to overcome, but I think he is, he, he is trying to seek to get the right balance between listening and leading. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting around, around the world to see you know, there is a great desire for America to reach out and to, to listen. But as I said this time last year, and my view hasn't, hasn't changed, um, it is uh, the destiny, in a sense, as well as the responsibility of America also to lead. And so, you know, I think it was important. I mean, personally, I think it was extremely important in Afghanistan that he made that commitment. Um, but, you know, the, 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 um, the, the trouble is, as, you know, as I've often said to people, the, de the decisions that, that the modern political leader is called upon to take are, are decisions that almost necessarily impact their own country, but the problems cannot be resolved simply by their own country. Even America on its own today cannot solve some of these problems. And I think, and this is what I say to people in Europe, um, you know, it's great to be a cheerleader for President Obama and, and to, to give him you know, high ratings and all the rest of it, but when he actually needs help and partnership, it would be good to step up and give him it too because he needs that, uh, frankly, more than he needs the praise, he needs the partnership. And so I think that he is, he, you know, yeah, I think he's, he's shown in that sense his, his ability to evolve a, a view of America that is engaged in the world, um, listening and leading. I, I, I think he has done that. Uh, I see as a moderator an opportunity for the first time this afternoon to drive a wedge between these two good friends. Because Ernesto, you smiled when uh, Tony gave the example of the Cairo speech, but frowned when he mentioned Afghanistan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Um, you are being a little bit too perverse today. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Uh, Playful, that's all. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, let me give you the a story of that. When I first came here, the first assignment that I was given was to come exactly to this place. Mm -hmm. It was a commemoration of uh, the second, I mean, 9-11, 2002. And there were two... Uh, undeservedly, I was put in the same panel with two distinguished Yale professors, uh, Professor Kagan and Professor Gaddis. And I don't know what was the, the topic, was geopolitics, but we ended up having a rather heated debate. Uh, they against me and me against them on uh, the question of Iraq. That was the issue. Needless to say, they were highly supportive and I was very worried about that possibility. This was 9-11-02. My little smile was yes. because of that. Mm -hmm. So that's why you are trying to <laughs> produce, but you won't achieve that. <laughs> I think that the... <laughs> oh, that was deft. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very deft. You see why I was president. Uh, <laughs> I think the most difficult thing is, is that these, these questions, though, the foreign policy questions, I think are, um, you know, they, they call for, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm interested in the academic issues to do with religious faith and globalization. I mean, they call for a, a different intellectual and conceptual framework than the ones that we've been used to in, in foreign policy. I mean, they really are complicated, difficult questions. And what President Obama um, is finding and will find is, is that as those decisions are taken, 
you know, they necessarily are divisive, I'm afraid. They, they, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, I, I was a moment, I don't know, you, you, you can express this better than me. You had a, we, were, we were once talking at something together, and, uh, and Esther was talking about the, the difficulties of political leadership and doing the right thing. And you had a great way of describing when you, when you, knew, when you were at your most proud of doing the right thing, even though this was an economic policy, it was immensely uh, difficult to do so. And I, you should, well, you remember it. <laughs> no, no, this is another anecdote. Uh, and you know how skillful he is to, uh, to change topics. <laughs> but it's great. No, no, no. I think I once mentioned to, to Tony that when I left office, an acquaintance of mine came and said, look, uh, I have this graph of your, I don't know how you call it, approval by the public or popularity, whatever. And when you left office, you were almost 70%, he said. You know, you should be proud. And I saw the graph and went back to April of uh, 95, four months after I had taken office. And my approval was uh, lower than Mexico's rate of inflation. <laughs> no, it was true. True. Absolutely true. And it was very logical because I have to increase 50% the value added tax. I have to make a cut in government expenditure of almost three points of uh, GDP. I have to increase prices of gasoline. I mean, I have to make this very difficult things because that's what the economy needed to, uh, to avoid uh, an even major disaster. So I told my friend, you said, well, you know, uh, you know when I was really proud to be president of Mexico? When my popularity was lowest. Because that's when I sensed that I could make a little difference by taking these decisions and taking all the heat that had to be taken to address that very difficult situation. And I think that's, you know, you, you don't, uh, it's very nice to be a leader when things go nice and uh, you, <laughs> people, you know, applaud it. I think the real leaders are when, when things are not like that. You have to take top decisions in the solitude of your heart and your office and say this is what, uh, after having listened to the solicited and all the unsolicited advice, this is my decision, this is my responsibility, and I'm going to do it. And, uh, and you know, one of my leaders and mentors has been also Tony Blair, <laughs> because he has faced that situation, and, you know, and that's why we, there is no other wish. I respect everything he has decided, <laughs> and he knows uh, why and how he has decided that. Yeah. Well, you know, the. By the way, if you don't know the history of the modern Mexican economy, the courageous and tough moves that President Zedillo took in 1994-95 panned out and worked. And there was a dramatic recovery, and the economy turned around and, uh, and has been in much better shape ever since. So it's a, uh, it was a major accomplishment. So th these two gentlemen just demonstrated why they're such great politicians, because they obviously suggest successfully ducked my, my attempt to engage them more deeply. In, in the question of Afghanistan. <laughs> I should be their gracious host, but I'm going to, be, I'm going to play the role of slightly more aggressive moderator. Yeah. So explain to me, here's the, here's the thing that I find paradoxical about Afghanistan compared to Iraq. If you think about, whatever you think about the, the the pro or con are going into Iraq. There was at least a colorable case that Iraq might be made into a modern nation, and that if one could make it into a modern democratic nation in the, middle, in the heart of the Middle East, that that would have a dramatic signaling effect on the rest of the Middle East, and so would be a big gain to U.S. foreign policy to the, to, to, and, and really to stability and global stability. If, if, you, if, if we truly could succeed or can succeed in building a modern democratic state in Iraq. It's hard for me to see that, that one that's even remotely feasible in Afghanistan and even if it were accomplished that would have the kind of spillover benefits that you get from building a democracy in the heart of the Middle East. I mean, Afghanistan's an isolated place. 
historically ungovernable, and it's hard to see any kind of dramatic spillover effects occurring there. So why are we investing so heavily in stabilizing Afghanistan? Well, we had a pretty big spillover effect from Afghanistan here in America. We did. Yeah. And, and those people are in Pakistan now. Yeah, but here's the thing that, and this is, this, look, this is my view. <laughs> you know, sometimes people say to me, well, it's not Afghanistan, it's, it's um, Pakistan you should worry about. And someone else says, uh, Iran, actually, is what you should worry about. Um, you could add to that Somalia. You could add to that Yemen. You sure. could add to that Lebanon or Palestine. Um, you could add to that the Mindanao dispute in the Philippines. Look, uh, this is okay. Right. <laughs> Agreed. And that's the problem. Uh, the right. problem is that that you see, I just fundamentally do not believe that people in Afghanistan, left to themselves, wouldn't be perfectly happy to elect their government and to have a proper system of government there. What, what you've got in these different parts of the world is a deliberate attempt to destabilize those countries, often from influences that are driven as much from externally as internally. And look, the whole purpose of my course here and what I'm doing with my, my foundation is because I believe that hard power itself is not enough to resolve these questions. And you need education, you need interfaith exchange, you need dialogue, you need nations and religious faiths coming together and understanding, but you also need to make it clear that where people are confronting the will of the, not just the international community, but the will of the people in these countries by violence and terror, you're prepared to stand up to it. Because otherwise, what are we actually saying? Because it's so difficult, they should just be left with, with in this case, the, the, the Taliban. Afghanistan in the early 1960s had a GDP uh, per head not much different from Portugal's. Afghanistan was a country made like this. It wasn't a country whose people desired to be in this situation. And one of the things that, that I think is most damaging about the way this whole debate has gone in the West over the past um, 10 years, and I you know, to share my own responsibility for it, is, is this idea somehow that when we talk about freedom and democracy and the rule of law, that these are kind of Western values. You know, and if only we had a greater understanding of different people, we'd understand that people in these different parts of the world don't really, they don't care about all that. It's not true. They care about it. I mean, who would choose? Who is, there's never been two democracies that have gone to war, right? And as far as I know, there's never any, a country that's been a democracy that's chosen by the will of the people to become a dictatorship. These are values of the universal values of the human spirit. They're not Western values. And where people have got the chance to take those values and use them to create their country, our job, in my view, is to stand alongside them and to support them and not to desert them in their hour of need. And in an interdependent world, as we have found with Afghanistan, a problem there does not stop there. It came, in the end, to us. And that's why we're there, and that's why, in my view, we have to see it through. Mm -hmm. I got an answer. That was great. Thank you. Um, let's shifting gears once again to uh, an area that um, I think audience would be interested in. Um, you know, you've both had distinguished careers as leaders. You've both chosen to spend part of your time, and in Esther's case, all of his time, at uh, at a great university, uh, presumably because you have some faith and confidence that the mission of an institution like this is actually going to contribute something important to society. Uh, you know, as you reflect upon your role in the university and your and your role as as leaders in the world. What, what, are, what, are the, what should we be doing? What are the competencies that we should be seeking to instill in young people to make them future citizens and future leaders? What, 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 could, what can we be doing? What are we doing now and what could we do better to encourage leadership and, and prepare people for leadership? He's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, you are working. Yeah, I'm working, but I, look, I, I tell you from, my, from I don't know what, what, how you think of this, but the thing that I would, 
I used to get a bit frustrated as a prime, a prime minister. Well, I got frustrated for many reasons as a prime minister, but, but I used to get frustrated sometimes when I didn't feel that the academic institutions were kind of giving me enough of the intellectual, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily mean the answer, but actually even the right discourse about the issues that matter. One of the things that I think is really important for the world of academia is, to, is always to understand that the best academic thought is the thought that leads to practical effective action. Now, I think actually Yale does do this. I think you're, the, 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 the whole concept is, 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 is right here, but that's what, what we need. The thing is, you know, with political leaders, I mean, they are, when all said and done, believe it or not, human beings, you know, they, they are still earthlings. Um, <laughs> but people kind of don't think of us like that, you know? They, 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 they think as if you have right, you just put down in that spot as the political leader of a country and, you know, you, you get there all the advice and it all comes in in the right way and all the rest. You're there trying to grapple really difficult problems. You're searching for ideas, you know? So I think the, the role of the academic institution is to provide the stimulus and the creativity and the innovation intellectually and conceptually. One of the things that you know, you know, I used to, to, to say to my people the whole time is, is that politics, believe it or not, and people don't think of it like this, politics is an intellectual business. It really is. I mean, you know, these, when he was dealing with it, I wish I'd had 70% <laughs> approval ratings by the time I left office, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, he couldn't deal with the economic crisis in a vacuum, he had to work it out. You need a conceptual framework. So I think the best um, thing that we could ask from you is, is to realize that, that, that we are actually, believe it or not, aware of our own fallibility and need support and help. And this is in a really changing world. You know when you were telling me about behavioral economics the other night and how it um, developed as a, as, a, as, a, as a field? I mean, that developed quickly. Right. But there are politicians today who are imbibing the concepts of that and using it to formulate, po I don't know whether right or wrongly, but using it to formulate policy. Now that is the right relationship, in my view, between mm -hmm. the academic and the, and the political world. Hmm? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I will just add, uh, because now uh, that I see Peter Salovey there, I remember that once he forced me to think uh, a little bit about uh, uh, I mean, uh, how I interpreted what this university, uh, at least in my experience, uh, gave uh, students uh, in contrast to what other universities uh, tried to give. And of course, we always have the reference in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, Harvard, where they say, well, we bring students here to make of them leaders. And that's a very synthetic way to express it. And I was thinking about my experience here. I said, well, I, you know, when I came here, I didn't sense that uh, my professors wanted, to, wanted me to learn how to be a leader. I, I, I don't recall that word uh, being repeated. Uh, but I think they did something more, more important, uh, which uh, really marked my life and that of others that were classmates of mine or came later. Uh, and one thing was, that somehow we learn, or we were instill this, the importance of serving. You know, it was important. If you study economics, or if you study, I'm talking about the social sciences, mm -hmm. you really had to have uh, a purpose. You really have to have uh, an inclination to serve a good cause. Another thing I learned here was that you have to learn to learn. <laughs> In the sense, you have to acquire critical thinking and trying to constantly be questioning even well-established truths. Mm. And with that, I thought, uh, you know, even if they don't tell you that you will be a leader, well, if you learn to serve, and if you learn to learn, then if you want to be a leader, you have a higher probability to be a leader. <laughs> but first, you have to have that vocation to serve and that humble attitude which comes with critical thinking and an attitude to learn or try to learn every day. 
you know, I think... I actually think it's one of the most remarkable things about these two gentlemen that they, they have, you know, they have been leaders of their countries, and yet you can see from this conversation, and those fortunate enough to take international trade from professors ADO or faith and globalization from Professor Blair know this, that despite years of power and despite the pattern that many is exhibited in many former leaders uh, when who are much more interested in, in uh, giving you the benefit of their wisdom. Uh, these gentlemen, are, they're lifelong learners. You can see it in the way they think. You can see it in the way they express themselves. They are still puzzling out the hard questions of today. And that, you know, that's a great virtue in a leader. They presumably led like that, and they're spending their life after being uh, global leaders still thinking like that still questioning, still learning, still growing intellectually. It is a fabulous model for all of us uh, to, see, to see this kind of, uh, this kind of um, characteristic in people that have been at the heights of power. It's fantastic. It's a great inspiration to us all. <clears throat> Last year, I closed the, one of the question sessions with um, with uh, Prime Minister Blair with the question of whether he preferred the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Um, he gave a great answer, but, but I couldn't think of quite as interesting a question to end with today, but I've got a reasonably good one. It turns out that next year, uh, Britain will be the host of the World Cup in the sport that they call football. No, no, South Africa will be the host. Well, South Africa is the host, that's the it. Host, South yeah. Africa is the host, that's right. They're but hosts. U.S., They're England the will play. But that's it. But the point is, <laughs> the U.S. and England you will play in too. the first <laughs> round of the tournament. They have not played in, in, uh, in, the World, in World Cup competition since the year 1950. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I think the U.S. won. <laughs> everyone remembers <laughs> that the one, U.S. pulled off zero. one of the great upsets <laughs> of all time. <laughs> Yes. What's your prediction for the final score? <laughs> well, it's been, our, our revenge has been a rather a long time coming. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I look forward to the, uh, to the English victory over the United <laughs> States of America. And afterwards, um, I think we, we should um, get you guys to, to accept um, as, as part of the, 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 the price of defeat that soccer is football. Right? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And we agree on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we have, to, we have to get Tony back to the UK overnight, so we thank you all for coming. We thank you both for participating in this great event. <laughs>